to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ god said you shall be holy for i am holy Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 44. Welcome to our study of living messages of the Old Testament. In this series, we're looking at various books in the Old Testament with an eye toward the practical. How does the book of Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus, what does it say about my life today? What can it do to help me live more faithful to God? And ultimately as well, we're looking at it with an eye towards seeing Christ. Where is Christ at? In the pictures in Leviticus, in the images, and the types, can we see Christ? And does that give us any view toward the New Testament as well? The key word to the book of Leviticus is the word holy or holiness. This occurs some 87 times in the book. God is teaching His people through the law, through the covenant, through sacrifice, how they can be holy. The problem is God is holy. His people are sinful or unclean, which occurs 194 times in the book of Leviticus. And thus, how can we bridge the gap? How can we bring sinful man together with a holy and pure God? And God's answer is through the word atonement, which occurs 45 times in the book of Leviticus. Something must make a sacrifice. Something must make atonement. Its lifeblood must be shed so that the gap between God and man can be bridged. Now, the key verse which we initially began with is Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. I want you to notice what God here says to the people. God says, for I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. God is here teaching Israel how to live correctly, how to live a life that honors God, how to live a, a life of holiness. The heathen people around them for many years have been involved in, involved in ungodliness, sexual immorality, proscuity, idolatry, all kind of heathen, uh, heathen sins. And yet God is here teaching His people, you've got to come out of that and you've got to be pure. Key phrase, God says 21 times, I am the Lord your God. He is emphasizing to His people that if they trust in Him, if they follow Him, if they don't look to the idol, idols around the nations, God can be their God and He can lead them toward that ultimate promised land. Now, as we think about keys in the book of Leviticus, the key chapter I would suggest is Leviticus chapter 16, that great chapter of the Day of Atonement, that day in Israel, Israel's history when that lamb is offered, that sacrifice is offered for the, the sins of the people. It, it takes the sins of the camp upon itself. It gives its life on their behalf, known to the Hebrews, Hebrews as Yom Kippur. It's that great day when Israel's sins were sent away. Friends, that suggests to us that not only did Israel have a day of atonement, but we as Christians have that great day as well, that day when Jesus made His sacrifice on the cross, that day when the gospel is preached, and the day when a person obeys the gospel and his life is made right with God. Now the name Leviticus simply means pertaining to the Levites. These are instructions for God's priest on things they must do during sacrifice, during worship, laws of cleanliness, so that they can be a pure and holy people. There's a New Testament companion to the book of Leviticus, and it would be the book of Hebrews. Hebrews makes many images or types directly out of Leviticus. The sacrifice, he talks about purity and holiness much, and thus to understand 
the New Testament. We've got to know the Old Testament better. Such books as the book of Leviticus. Well, here's the main problem as we suggested to you in the book of Leviticus. God is pure and holy. God cannot lie. Hebrews 6 verse 18 God is above sin and above reproach. Habakkuk 1 verse 13, God is of pure eyes, then behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness, and yet man is sinful. We have all sinned. Romans 3 verse 23, there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, the Bible teaches in Romans 3 verse 10, as a result of our sin and God's holiness, there's that separation. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, God is separated from us. We're separated from God because of our sins. Well, the great question that Leviticus answers is, how does a, a sinful man approach holy God? And the answer is through sacrifice. I want you to look at the words of Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 and notice that blood is key and essential in dealing with the sin problem. God says in Leviticus 17 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls for it is the blood. Listen, it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. What is it that covers sin? Whatever, what is it that atones, stands in the place, and, and bears the guilt and the brunt? It's the blood. It's that life that's shed. Whether it be a lamb, whether it be a, a bull, whether it be a goat, whether it be two turtle doves, something gave its life so that that gap, that bridge could be made between God. Friends, there's a beautiful passage in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews that teaches us the same idea with a view toward the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Jesus made that, that ultimate sacrifice, that once for all sacrifice, so that, that man could be brought back to God and there would be no more need for daily sacrifices as you see in the book of Leviticus. Now, there are many laws given in the book of Leviticus. You've got laws of sacrifice, chapters 1 through 6. You've got various laws given to the priests specifically for them in chapters 6 through 10. There are laws on purity, what the people can do to keep themselves pure chapters 11 through 22. There are laws about the feast and the special days, chapters 23 through 25, and then there are various special laws given to the people in chapters 26 and 27. And so we remember the book of Leviticus as God's laws on sacrifice and purity and how to be holy. But now let's make some practical application. What are the living messages of Leviticus? You know, a person picks up Leviticus and you read about the sacrifices, you read about the laws, and sometimes you get bogged down in all that and you say, well, how does that apply to me? What's that got to do with my life? Here's how Leviticus is one of the most practical books in the Old Testament. Number one, we learn from Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, there is a need for a sin substitute. Trespass offering, grain offering, you've got all kind of various offerings, sin offering, you've got all these offerings, and in each something is giving its life. Something stands in the place of. There is the absolute need, necessity for a sin substitute for God and man to be right. Now here's the important thing though. What about all those lambs? What about all those goats? What about all those bulls that were offered? Did they really fill the gap? Listen to the words of Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4. The scripture says, But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Well, did, did God command it? Sure He commanded it. It was all predicated upon the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 17 teaches us that. It was in keeping with the law of God at that time. But could, the, could a bull, could a goat, could it really take away sin? God said, it's not possible. What is possible? What can take away sin? Hebrews 10 verse 12 tells us the answer to that. Look at the beautiful words of Hebrews 10 verse 12. The scripture says, 
But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. What happens if you commit some sin and you have to make a sacrifice and the very next day you do that again? You go out to the field and you start all over again. Is that the way it is today? Thank God. We live in the age of Christianity where there is that once for all sacrifice of sin. Now, does that mean we ought to sin and live it up? Surely not. How shall we continue in sin or how shall grace abound if we continue in sin? It won't. Romans 6 verse 1 teaches us we need to do our best to live a life free of sin. But friends, we live in the age where that one sacrifice has been made for sin when Jesus gave His life. He became a ransom for sin. Galatians 1 verse 4. He became our redemption. Ephesians 1 verse 7. He became our, our hope and our mercy and our grace that is seen in His great offering. And so there is that great need, that desperate need for a sin substitute and ultimately that comes in Jesus Christ. Another living message from the book of Leviticus is found in Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2 and it emphasizes the need for proper worship. God wants me and God wants you to worship as He's directed, not as we feel or we think or not based on what's popular or what everybody else is doing. You know, we learned the very powerful lesson about that in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Notice these words. The Bible says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, notice this, which He had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You know, some might say, well, what's it matter where you get the fire? They offered the sacrifice. Friends, to God it was a big thing. And say, oh, that's small. No, not with God. God said they offered a strange, some versions will say, unauthorized fire, listen now, which He had not commanded them. What did they do? They altered God's laws and they did something God had not asked for. Friends, when we worship God, oh, how we need to make sure, how we need to be very careful that we only do what God asks us to do. God doesn't want a circus. God doesn't want a rock band on the stage. God doesn't want us to do things that are not authorized. And think about some of the acts of worship. When it comes, for example, to the Lord's Supper, what does God want us to do? On the first day of the week, they came together to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7. Every week has a first day. Christians assembled on that day, and they remembered the Lord's death. What does God want us to do? Does He want us to do it on Christmas and Easter only? It's not what you find in the New Testament. Does He want us to do it once a quarter, maybe two or three times? No, that's not what you find in the New Testament. What do does He want us to do it with something other than grape juice and fruit of the vine and unleavened bread? Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. No, God wants us to use the elements He chose. God wants us to do it when He chose. Well, what about something like preaching? Can we change preaching to maybe acting? Wouldn't it be great if somebody thought up some great play and you can have this big... No, that's not what God wants. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those who were lost. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. God wants us to preach the Word, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Well, what about maybe when it comes to music or singing? Does it really matter if we pick a guitar or if we beat on drums or we play a piano? Is God really going to care about that? Here's what God said, sing and make melody in your heart. When God said sing, that, made it, that means that it must be vocal, that it must be a cappella. When God tells us to make melody in our heart, that tells us the specific instrument God wants us to use. God wants us to use the instrument of the heart. When God specified how, when He told us the exact instrument, that eliminates all else. God wants man to sing, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, to sing with the Spirit and the understanding. That's how you make melody in your heart. You, you have enthusiasm, you're joyful, and 
you think through the words that are sung. And so God expects us, just like He expected Nadab and Abihu, to do exactly what He says in worship. Another very practical lesson comes from the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. That great day, when the offering for the camp of Israel was made, when the sins are placed on the animal and that animal is sent out into the wilderness to bear the sin, when one bird dies and the other is let go, dipped in the blood of the first bird, again, so symbolic of how sin is being released from the people and how something had to give its life so that something could be freed from sin. Friends, that's such a beautiful picture of the image of Christianity. John chapter 19, verse 34. The Bible tells us that the soldier took his spear, his sword, and he pierced the side of Jesus, and out came blood and water. Look at the offering that is made. Zechariah 13 verse 1 comments that a, a fountain for sin and for cleansing was opened in Jerusalem. Well, when was that? When Jesus died on the cross. Well, when is the Day of Atonement for Christians? It began on the cross. When Jesus gave His life as that ultimate sacrifice, it culminated in the preaching of the gospel in Acts chapter 2. When they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And the, the answer was, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. They received that atonement. The blood of Jesus was applied to their spirit. And any person who obeys the gospel from that time forward, the sacrifice of Jesus has great effect for them as well. Now the book Leviticus also deals with laws on purity, morality, and it deals with how to live a pure and moral life. And one of the things that Leviticus speaks very candidly, very plainly about, is the subject of homosexuality. We live in a world where people refer to it as an alternate lifestyle. Uh, don't pick on that. That's an alternate lifestyle. You can't say anything about two men if they want to live together or two women if they want to live together. And if we say anything against that, people have the idea that we're being mean or unkind. How does God... Here's what we want to ask today. Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37 verse 17. What has God said? What did He say in Leviticus about homosexuality? And what does He say today on that same subject? It's so sad that for a TV show to make it, it's got to have homosexuals on it. Uh, the more you promote them, the more people seem to like it. Why is that? That shows the state that we've come to in our society and how godless we are. Well, let's notice what God says on this sin. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, and in Leviticus 20, verse 13, that it is a sin against God deserving of death. Notice these two scriptures. God says in Leviticus 18, 22, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. You know, when God says it's an abomination, that's the fury, the, the, the red-hot fury of God. That's how much God hates homosexuality. And not only that, God says if they're caught doing that, they're deserving of death. It is a crime against God. It's a crime against marriage. And friend, it is immoral and ungodly. So it's okay. That's good and well. We find that in the book Leviticus. And yes, under Moses' law, that wasn't correct. But today, we're living under the age of grace. And isn't God going to allow people to live any way they want to as long as they love Him? Friend, that's a false ideology. And Romans 1 verses 26 and 27 could not be more clear that homosexuality is still a sin against God. Look at these words. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 says this, For this reason... God gave them up to vile passions 
<clears throat> he says in Romans 1.26, For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Notice how God describes this. It is a vile passion. It is against nature. It's unnatural. It is something deserving of punishment. It's an error. Friend, God couldn't be any more clear. Homosexuality in the New Testament is just as strongly condemned. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11 says, that such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in that class, two of them are homosexuals and lesbians. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's that mean? It's as clearly as we know how to make it. If a person lives in that lifestyle and dies in it without repenting and get right with God, the scripture says they won't go to heaven. Homosexuals and lesbians who are practicing, who do not repent of that, will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what God says in His Word verbatim. And so it is a sin. It is something we need to speak out against. And friend, it's done so much harm to the fabric and moral of our society and to the, to the beauty of marriage. It's, it's hurt and degraded our morals. And so we must realize that's not God's will. Another lesson that we learn from the book of Leviticus is that one must respect father and mother. Leviticus 19.3 and Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 9 teaches children to respect and to reverence their father and mother. Oh, how we need today to have that same respect for parents. Parents, bring up your children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children, obey your parents for this is right. There needs to be that respect and obedience for father and mother because of who they are. Just as we respect God as our father, so children must obey and respect their parents. Young people, listen carefully. You don't need to talk back to your parents. You don't need to rebel against them. You don't need to say things against mom and dad around your friends. God wants you to respect and honor and obey your parents. A failure to do that is a failure to obey Him. And then we also learn the penalty for adultery found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10, if two people are caught in the act of adultery, they're to be put to death. Again, adultery meaning relationship with another outside of the marriage bond where you're cheating on having a relationship with someone and so it is against the will of God. In that class that we mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11, Part of those people who will not inherit the kingdom of God ultimately will not go to heaven are adulterers. Adultery is a sin against the God of heaven and one must do his very best to stay away from that. You know, another practical living message from Leviticus is the separation that we find for God's priest. In Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 2, God says to Moses and to Aaron, I want the priests to separate themselves from the holy things so that they can be solely dedicated to my service. You know, the, as I think about this separation that Aaron, that Moses, that the Levites had to go through, it, it made them unique. It made them special in many ways. How true it is today that Christians are that separated, that unique, that special people of God. Look at the words of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible says, But you are a chosen generation, listen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We're God's chosen, special, a royal priesthood. And thus, our lives must be lives of separation from this old world. Paul said in Romans 12, beginning in verse 1, I beg you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world. Listen, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, when I think about the book of Levit Leviticus, 
I'm also reminded of the need for us to give God our best. Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 20, God wanted the first fruits. God wanted the best from His people as an offering to Him. How we today need to give our God the best. You know, God doesn't want anything but first place in our life. God wants the best of everything and He deserves the best of everything that we have. Look at the words of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first, not second, not third, not last. God wants to be first in our life. Now, one last practical lesson that I want us to notice, and it's a very, a very practical one for us today. In the Bible, sorcery, mediums, all those kind of things are condemned by God. Look in Leviticus chapter 19 and notice what verse 31 says. God says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. God's Word and God has all the answers. God is the only guide and He's the only direction that we need. And thus, men today and women today still need to avoid palm readers and fortune tellers and opening up the paper to see what your astrological zodiac sign is and all the tea leaves say. We don't need that. You've got all the direction you need right here. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. The book of Leviticus teaches us Jesus and the sacrifice He made. The application is Jesus and the sacrifice He made. It's the permanent way to be brought back to God. Friend, are you right with God today? Has that substitute of the blood of Christ been applied to your spirit? If not, won't you become a Christian? Won't you hear the Word of God? Romans 10 verse 17. Won't you believe that Jesus is that, that sin offering? John 8 24. Would you repent of your sins? Luke 13 3. Would you make that great confession? I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Romans 10 verse 10. And would you be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. We hope today that as we have studied the book of Leviticus, each one of us will be encouraged to be holy as our God is holy. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about all souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.